The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. There's these verticals, you know, you hear monitoring, you hear EMS, and, and you hear DERMS, all these different energy data sort of silos. And I think at the end of the day, the, the reality is they're all still like so isolated from each other. But these systems, they're duplicative and they don't talk to each other. I think what's coming is, you know, a unification of the monitoring and control planes for all of these assets, solar, storage, EV charging, hydroelectric, you name it. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. Today on the Clean Power Hour... Monitoring, Intelligence, and Control in Distributed Generation. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Please give us a rating and a review and reach out to me. I love hearing from my listeners. My guest today is Alex Nassi. He is the co-founder and CEO of a company called Watch, which you may not have heard of, but you soon will. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Good morning, and I am so excited to be on. This is great. It's your first podcast, I understand. So I'm looking forward to bringing Alex Nussie to my listeners. And it's heady days in the solar industry. You're a young professional still, but uh, you have a great story. And I'm just so thrilled to bring your story and watch to the podcast. But Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get interested in technology and then clean energy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, heady days in the solar industry, indeed. Um, I've, uh, I guess, I've been in the solar and broader renewables industry for coming up, or just over four years now. It feels like a lifetime in some ways, but I also know that I'm uh, definitely new to this space by by a lot of measures. Um, my, my personal background is in commercial software as a service, so everything from enterprise uh, enterprise software, CRMs, uh, to autonomous vehicles and uh, different kinds of like application performance monitoring. And I fell in love with solar in undergraduate. I was at Georgia Tech uh, as part of the competitive solar car racing team. If you haven't heard of this before, it's a 2000 mile cross country trip in a, a solar powered electric vehicle. Uh, and I did that really for fun, but it kind of caught the solar bug. And ever, you know, after leaving the team, it was always a question of of when I was going to get into the renewable space professionally um, rather than, a, than an if. So you're a good person to answer that question, which I get lots of. How far can a car go on solar energy? You know, uh, if the car is light enough and you give up all of your basic amenities, then it can it can run essentially forever. <laughs> um, the the American challenge is along the Oregon Trail and the national or the international challenges in Australia through the outback. And the best teams will run at 65 miles an hour, you know, essentially forever, as long as the sun's shining, but uh, cool. they're not the most comfortable vehicles. Kind of like a spaceship on, uh, on the ground, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, so what was the, what is the origin story though of watch? Why did you create watch? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we actually got started making IV curve testers. You know, we we wanted one for the solar car racing team to measure our uh, solar array and decided to build our own as part of a sort of undergrad design project in college. Uh, and, you know, we had a bunch of contacts in the commercial solar world through that team and, and, and networking events. And um, I, so it's kind of a long story, but one conversation led to another and, and we kind of discovered this hole in the space as we saw it in uh, data analytics. Everyone had a lot of data, uh, not always well standardized or or normalized, uh, and didn't really know what to do with it. And uh, my 
like I mentioned, my co-founders and I met in undergrad and had all kind of gone our separate ways, but decided to uh, apply for this DOE program called the American Made Challenges. It's sort of very early stage funding. Um, I'll, I'll plug that for any entrepreneur thinking about getting into clean tech, American Made Challenges. Uh, and they wrote us our first check, $50,000. And that was enough for us to kind of start the business and um, build out the first MVP of the product and, and start finding partners and early customers. Yeah, that's a great program that the DO, DOE runs. You know, it's basically seed money, right? For yep. early stage companies that are making innovations in clean energy. And, um, and this is a very important role that the DOE plays at many levels of development, actually, not just early stage. But uh, so, but what was the problem, I guess, that you saw with the industry and the opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the <clears throat> actually first, just to finish my my plug on the the American Made Challenges, it's it's sort of three levels, I would say, um, across different prize programs, not just solar, also hydroelectric, and uh, it's one of the only DOE or federal funding programs at all where they'll put money in uh, uh, ahead of time, so you're not filing for reimbursement. So they'll actually just write you the check upfront and uh, really change the game for our our business. Um, let us get let us get started. Wow. Yes. So um, when we got started, we thought the problem we were solving was uh, uh, just a question of data analytics. Uh, but really, as we dug further into the space, that the whole data value chain for the emerging and, and most rapidly growing businesses in this space um, was, we were just shocked at what we found. And I, I think that providing uh, simple, easy to use and easy to understand intelligence for operators with growing portfolios is, is what we do today. Um, and we work with uh, clients with projects ranging from 10 kilowatts up to about 25 megawatts, um, really anything in that range to help a small team of uh, operations professionals, o &M providers, uh, manage a very large geographically distributed portfolio. Yeah. So you're a, you're a performance monitoring platform at your core. And is there a... a in most of these systems, there's some kind of a hardware platform, but tell us what are the components and and what are the benefits to the status quo, I guess. That's the big question in most yes. listeners' minds. Like today, companies are using also energy, probably 80%. Uh, that is the gorilla in the room. So tomorrow when they convert to watch, what is different? Yeah, that's a that is a great question. Um, you might not be surprised to hear that I get asked that a lot. <laughs> uh, I would say that at, at our core, um, just to clarify, Watch is a data company. We think of ourselves as a data company first, and not a hardware business or a, a sort of pro serve provider. Um, we're a technology vendor. Um, when we compare Watch to other legacy products in this space, um, we sort of focus on three areas of, of differentiation. Um, the first is simplicity. We think it's really important for scale is just repeatability and simplicity in, pro, uh, in the process of collecting and analyzing that data. Um, so all of our hardware solutions are sort of programmed identically at the factory. It's all self-service setup, scanning QR codes, uploading CAD files. We try to make it as easy as possible to monitor your project well, um, make doing the right thing easy. Um, and that, that means across the board, selecting the right equipment, um, being secure, collecting high fidelity data, um, all of that should be uh, turnkey wherever possible. Um, I'd say the second and, and biggest what really drives people towards us most of the time is, is what we can do with that data on the intelligence side. Uh, the sort of core um, feature, I guess, uh, of the performance analytics platform at Watch is our digital twin. Um, I, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but essentially, we can use the what we know about the design of your project to simulate its ideal output uh, at, at any time, second to second, uh, at the level of the site, an inverter, or you know a string of modules. Uh, and, and usually, when people think of performance analytics in that way, they're thinking in watts and, and kilowatts. Um, we're sort of closer to something like a PV cyst, uh, where we're analyzing the sort of ideal voltage and current of every module at the site uh, in, in essentially real time. And by overlaying that um, digital twin, that ideal output characteristic of every component with the real data can help operators find problems. Um, you know, we say commission a site in the first minute you can find single module stringing mistakes just by looking at the, the string voltages on the 
different. Yeah. Um, and how do you create that digital twin? I'm, I'm imagining that you take an as built of the solar farm or solar facility, and then you're embedding that information in a piece of hardware ultimately, but it's, it's a software model of the, the, of the facility. And then you're doing this real time comparison of here's what's happening. Here's what should be happening. And is that kosher or something is not right. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in, in order to get that ideal output of the site, um, we do need the as built. We try to make that as easy as possible. If you have a PD syst, you can just actually upload that directly to watch and we'll we'll pull the relevant data out, or you can sort of build it in our in our UI in the cloud. Um it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh just all the information that you'd expect in a single line drawing. Um and then from there, that that sort of stringing and, and physical layout information is combined with live weather data captured by meteorological stations on site or sort of any any weather data source. But we want that live real uh, feed. And then the third is the, the performance characteristics of all of the components. Um, so you think of like a pan file for a module or the data sheet for a solar inverter. Um, we also use primarily sort of independent test lab data. So CEC, as an example, they'll buy modules and inverters and, and actually test them on a bench. And we use those real performance characteristics rather than um, what the manufacturer's data sheet says. And okay. then run all three of those things through our sort of simulation engine. And you get that exactly, that uh, mm -hmm. that sort of optimal output for the whole farm, uh, the yeah. whole installation and our alerting system will will point out any deviations from uh from that that you know sort of ideal baseline and how hard is this uh, you know there's there's such a variety of types of equipment um you know literally dozens of solar panel manufacturers and inverter manufacturers maybe not dozens of inverter manufacturers but a dozen uh certainly um can you play with all types of hardware irrespective or are there limitations there? You're looking at uh, the oldest sort of vintage of solar farms. There may be some availability or compatibility issues, but, but generally anything built in the last five years uh, and certainly coming up in the future, uh, we, we like to say we have universal compatibility with new new equipment. Yeah. Um, luckily, there's enough of a standards approach, uh, standards driven approach these days that we can figure out how to get the how to get the data into watch. And if, if I'm a, if I'm an asset owner, and you know, today, I've got my system, call it also energy for l lack of a better expression, right. And, you know, that system is giving me, uh, you know, a green, yellow, red light, basically, and then tomorrow I install watch. What can I expect? What is the compelling value proposition, I guess, for watch that makes customers make the switch? Yeah. So I think the question I like to ask asset owners is how do you know if your portfolio is healthy? You know, when you're talking about utility scale sites with people on, you know, physical staff physically on site all the time, that's pretty easy to quantify. Um, you can just go check things. Uh, but with a, a distributed portfolio, how do you know if it's healthy? Um, and that, that green, yellow, red that you're getting out of um, sort of uh, the standard monitoring tools today, uh, the accuracy on that is uh, fairly low and it doesn't really help you identify the source of the, that underperformance. Um, with watch, we try to, we tell folks that if you sort of follow our guidelines, the accuracy on our diagnostics is about one and a half percent sort of total, total error. Um, and at the highest level, what does that mean for our customers? Um, empirically on average across our whole install base in CNI and DG after customers switch to watch, we see a average performance improvement, whether adjusted of, uh, about 8% in the first three months. Um, and that's that's a sort of shockingly high number, uh, and I I won't begin to claim that we're actually doing the work of resolving those issues. But you know these portfolios are growing so rapidly. Our our goal is to put you know confident information or confident uh, uh, diagnoses in the hands of operators so they can do their job in a timely uh, in a timely fashion and and make sure that everything is performing the way it should. So how does how does I'm, I'm now I'm a little confused. I, I'm I'm also excited. I mean, eight percent an eight percent improvement is a significant number, but I don't quite follow how watch can lead to improved performance. Yeah, I, I mean, our 
core client base is uh, commercial scale solar um, and increasingly uh, DG sort of front of meter community scale solar as well. Um, but these assets have, uh, they vary so much in the way that they're installed, you know, different tilts and azimuths all on one roof, different string lengths. Um, yep. The traditional approach is to finding small sources of underperformance. Uh, it's very coarse grained. So you can you know, easily miss small problems. And, and when we bring on uh, these commercial portfolios, we generally find um, you know, lots of small issues with these sites. They, some of them have been there since the sites were built. Um, just stringing mistakes, you know, too many modules on this string, not enough on this string. Okay. Um, and these are the kinds of things that uh, uh, they really add up over time. And just helping helping asset owners be more effective in their dispatching. Um, th the third sort of element I, I was going to touch on with our value prop is, is this idea of remote control over assets. So when you think of utility scale, of course, everyone has full control and, and dispatchability on their assets. But as you get down into smaller and smaller sizes, that, uh, uh, that capability is generally not found. It's cost prohibitive in the way that it's traditionally implemented. Um, but with Watch, we give from any project size across our whole sort of service range, you get uh, near real-time remote control over these assets. And that can be used for sort of the, the obvious things. Uh, People think grid services when I talk about controls generally or, or EMS, mm -hmm. um, but you can also do things like clear faults or um, run remote diagnostics uh, all without, you know, leaving your nice air conditioned office. Um, and that that sort of, again, leads to the, the goal of reducing truck rolls, saving time and improving efficiency for these uh, often overworked teams. And can you achieve an installation without going on site? A great question. Um, so the best data uh, we generally find is collected when customers use our, our hardware. Um, but we have a number of different ways of getting the data into our into our cloud. And we can absolutely do sort of no touch retrofits in many, many cases. If the data lives somewhere, um, we can probably get it into watch. Uh, that control component generally does require um, a site visit. Uh, very fast installation in almost all cases. And we've kind of seen it all in terms of retrofits. But uh, we we like to start with new customers. Let's bring all of your data from your whole portfolio into Watch from day one. Um, and then as you're building new sites, replacing components at old sites, um, sort of bring the, the best of the functionality to your historic portfolio by retrofitting on our hardware. Does that make sense? Yes and no. I mean, I uh, so what is the what is the standard hardware installation that you're that you're making. Yeah. And I mentioned that we are uh, at our core a data company. So we don't actually manufacture any hardware in house. Mm -hmm. um, we partnered with a couple of uh, uh, different manufacturers here in North America, um, predominantly AccuEnergy, well known for their energy meters. Uh, they build sort of, uh, as anyone that's bought monitoring before would expect, sort of a turnkey DAS, is the, the term, enclosure, weather rated uh, box with a power supply, you know search protection, cellular modem, and our, uh, we call it an, an edge controller. We think of it as kind of a data logger all grown up. Okay. Um, it's a data logger with the control capabilities that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of the only branded piece of, of hardware in that box. Um, largely open architecture. It's all brands that customers are already familiar with. And then the brain at the center of that uh, system is, is our first party product. Yeah. And as a data first company, how do you explain this to lay people like why this is so important? I mean, it's great to have these statistics about, well, we're going to improve the performance of your asset, bottom line, right? Everybody wants more KWH out of their asset. That That is revenue uh, one way or another. It's either savings or it's revenue if yeah. it's a third-party owned PPA, right? You know, everybody and their mother is uh, is is a data company also, to some extent. So what it, what is changing about software as a service and our capabilities in data analytics that uh, make you special? Yeah, I, I, so you said something which I think is really important. Everyone and their mother is, is a data company. And I think, um, I think to some extent that's true. I think uh, you, any business in solar is going to try and find a data angle, especially with all the, you know, the, the noise and buzz around um, machine learning and AI. Uh, but 
really, I think part of a differentiates watch is that's, that's all we do. That's our specialty. And our customers sort of up and down the size range look to us as a partner in data and then, and everything that comes with that security communications. Uh, and then that lets them treat sort of the other parts of the value chain, things like converters as, as commodity hardware. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not bound to, you know, sort of a walled garden ecosystem of, of one sort of hardware manufacturers data, uh, data ecosystem, um, it means that you can have more choice around availability and pricing and lead times um, uh, on that, on that area. I also think we are able to deliver a service that is easier to use, uh, easier to work with. We're able to be you know, nimble and, and flexible because of our sort of cloud and software first approach. Um, you know, we have tried to take as much of the complexity out of uh, hardware and into software as possible because it's much faster to change and it lets our customers sort of get to market as quickly as, as they can. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. Yeah. So what are some of the other benefits, I guess, you know, <clears throat> if you're a SCADA engineer at a, at a big asset owner and, um, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, uh, is our solution good enough? What else should they know about watch that might make them go, Oh, we should probably take a demo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we think of skate engineers as some of our best friends. Watch is not attempting to replace uh, SCADA and, and it's sort of traditional definition. Um, generally for our larger projects, we're sitting on top of a, of a, a SCADA system on site and providing that remote observability and intelligence layer where SCADA is enforcing the you know very low level safety controls. Um, that is not something we're trying to, to displace just to be clear. Um, though for a lot of our smaller projects, we can solve problems that uh, traditionally, you would use SCADA to solve things like zero export control um, or economic dispatch of, of, of assets. Um, we can sort of handle that in our product, uh, eliminating the need for SCADA on small small systems. Uh, but I think generally the thing that uh, our sort of most sophisticated customers like is uh, how easy to work with we are. Um, like I mentioned, everything comes from the factory, from watch, uh, sort of programmed agnostically. So you can keep a pile of our parts in the back of your truck. And if you're on site, you can grab one of our edge devices, plug it in and start working with essentially any configuration that you have on site and get that set up in our, our cloud product, uh, in just a handful of minutes. Um, you're not, uh, because everything's standardized, you're not dealing with long lead times generally. Um, and you're not shipping things back to the factory to be, to be reprogrammed. Um, and then it lets us also, uh, solve some of the most frustrating problems that skate engineers face around, uh, networking and firewall configurations and VPNs. Our technology, uh, it can work with almost any networking configuration, um, and, the uh, control layer and is, is all handled in our sort of application layer protocol. So, um, very easy to work with. I think is really where we, we try to. Yeah. I would love to be a fly on the wall uh, as a technician is installing these systems, not just yours, but others, right? And seeing, um, because it's easy to say, oh, it's going to be a piece of cake. Uh, and the, that, that I guess that's one of the, the gnarly questions is truly how easy is it? Um, do you have an example for, you know, for us, in terms of get being onboarded by a by a customer in some sizable manner in a way that they were like wow uh this was easy yeah yeah i um I, I think you said something really important it's easy to talk a big game and the question is always you know how how true is that um and we really uh, if, if this was a sales call we'd really just encourage you to try it once 
You know, a, a lot of these players are building sites constantly. Um, just give us a try on one project. Uh, you don't like it, you know, leave you alone. Uh, and and that sort of uh, first one's free mentality, I think, is is the the best way to believe it is to see it. And we we find that once customers try us once, um, we're generally uh, uh, mm. in the door. Um, I think there's a thousand and one little ways that monitoring systems, control systems can create frustration. And we spent the first three years of our business just sitting on roofs and in fields, talking to the electricians and technicians that were installing these systems and ironing out every little kink that we could. And when we bring new customers on, I tell them, if if you are frustrated with something, I want you to tell me, right? This is not a, a done product. That's the beauty of, of software, right? Is it's always improving. So if you have feedback, um, we have an email address that goes to our whole product team. All the engineers get it. And we release new features every Monday. Um, so if, if there is a, a burr in your process, um, tell us and we'll fix it. And I think that's kind of the first wow moment that a lot of our, our customers feel is they do an install, they're 99% happy with it, and they have one piece of feedback. And then the next week uh, for their next installation, that's it's already solved. Um, and that's, uh, we. I think by leveraging the latest and greatest technology, um, it lets us be agile even with a small team and responsive to customers' needs. So the company started in 2020 with a grant and a handful of people with some good ideas and some, <laughs> you know, uh, some skills at where, where have you come in the last four years? And, and what are your, uh, what are you seeing in the market in terms of your, you know, of your future? Yeah, let's see four years. Like I said, it feels like a lifetime sometimes. Um, it would get started late 2019, early 2020 with that DOE funding. And the first, um, really the first two and a half years were like heads down building. You know, we had a handful of pilot customers that were willing to try things and iterate with us. Um, and we built out a minimum viable product, which is pretty wide in this space. You need to be able to cover a lot of bases. And I uh, learned just a ton from those those three or four of our earliest clients. Um Tell us about and them. Then, uh, is there are there yeah. some clients you can talk talk about? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say uh, our, our first customer. I'll give them a shout out. Uh, Cherry Street Energy here in Atlanta. Uh, Radiant Solar is another one very early with us, also here in Atlanta. Um, and in that first two and a half years, we were very sort of geographically focused uh, in the southeast, um, which has some interesting you know, market implications for the kinds of projects we see, as you might imagine. Um, but you know, I, I just use Cherry Street as an example. They're building large CNI installations, rooftops, carports, things like that for everyone from the Fortune 500 to uh, uh, municipalities and um, nonprofits. And the, that portfolio varies widely in composition, capacity, technology. Uh, and once their team knows our product really well, you know, we'll, we, we can be rolled out on a dozen projects in, you know, in, in one order and it's all comes on one pallet, their team doesn't need to worry about what boxes go where. It's all, it's all identical hardware and, and they can, uh, uh, it's that collaborative mindset. I just want to like sort of focus on that again. I think as mm. this industry is changing and evolving, um, we, we like to work with people that are forward thinkers so that we can skate to where the puck is going from a technology perspective. And, and to answer the, the, the question you asked about sort of growth over the last um, four years, it's, it's been about, is it four? months ago now, we raised our first sort of institutional venture capital funding, some great investors from across the energy industry. And in the last just year and change, we've gone from you know, a handful of, of early projects uh, in the Southeast to got about a just over a thousand sites, 22 states now covering most of the different markets. Um, and I think the, the trend that we see is sure you hear this from everybody, but storage, um, it's happening. <laughs> and anybody that isn't thinking about their storage strategy is, is behind. And that's sort of the big focus for us. We think we have a really differentiated and competitive project in solar monitoring. So storage is kind of the, the, the next logical step for us. And how hard is that uh, to, to go from solar alone to solar and storage? Well, the good news is from a commercial and industrial sort of project perspective, I think that all of these buildings eventually are going to want storage. It's a question of, you know, how far down the price curve uh, does, does, you know, do batteries need to come before that makes sense? But from, from that perspective, I think we're in the right segment uh, to be innovating 
in that area. Um, all of our customers are, are developing storage strategies. So we learn a lot from working with them. Um, but it's definitely a big jump. Um, I think the good news is this sort of uh, controls enabled strategy that we've taken means that we can roll out storage control features to our customers without adding any new hardware. Um, and I think that's fairly differentiated in the, the monitoring space. Our data logger is is capable of, of doing everything from reporting data to running sophisticated you know, model predictive control loops on site. And that means that as our customers add storage, EV charging, submetering, whatever it is, um, just tie it into the, the intelligence you already have on site and lights up as another little panel in our, our UI. Mm. Um, so I, I think what's particularly challenging about storage is how much it varies based on use case. You know, you have people that are looking for demand charge mitigation, resilience, uh, you know, wholesale market participation, yeah. and is a lot of moles to whack, um, for lack of a better term. Yes, for sure. The value stack of storage is, is very nuanced and geographic. Uh, check out my interview with David Braun recently from Intelligent Generation. Uh, Listening to that this morning, actually. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we love IG uh, here in PJM territory. You know, I'm I'm looking at your about page. Uh, the The website for watch is watch w a t t c h dot i o, and if you go to the about, you'll see uh, some bios of the leadership team or the the board of directors. But scroll down, and you see a heat map of of uh, your customer base, which is. Quite impressive for a four-year-old company, you know, over a thousand installations, 22 states. And yeah, you are heavy in the Southeast, but you're in California, Arizona, Texas, New Jersey, Massachusetts. I mean, you're in most of the major Colorado, most of the major solar markets. So kudos. Thank you. It's been it's been a really exciting last year. Um, and I think the good news is as the industry is growing so quickly, you know, uh, all, all ships rise together or whatever the metaphor is um, with the tide. And mm. we like partnering with the forward thinking, uh, you know, thought leaders in this industry and as their deployment grows. Um, so, so does ours. Yeah. So what in our last few minutes together, Alex, where do you see the industry going and what is it that keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. This is two questions. I'll start with what keeps me up at night uh, and that's cybersecurity. I think um, there are the sort of the big um, news stories that most folks in the industry see, uh, you know, European wind farms getting shut down or uh, uh, inverter backends getting hacked and, and um, you know, unauthorized users being able to push firmware updates. Uh, but as the penetration of these small scale assets just continues to increase, um, cybersecurity really really does uh, uh, keep me up at night. I think there's, um, you know, you have these uh, uh, NERC, SIP, uh, critical infrastructure protection has cybersecurity guidelines, but those only apply to very large projects. And, uh, you know, these five, 10 megawatt community solar projects aren't governed by a lot of the legislation and, and, and uh, requirements around cyber. And that adds up, you know, you don't need hundred megawatt projects if you can get into enough small ones. <laughs> um, so right. I think, that's an, another example of somewhere, it's something we take seriously and are working with, again, small team, not going to claim to be the, the global experts on this, but we want to know who those experts are and, and work with them and learn from them and make it as easy as possible um, to do the right thing for our customers. You know, if you're a EPC, you you probably don't have cybersecurity professionals uh, on your staff. Um, so we want to make the point and click option um, a, a secure and reliable one. Um, so if you have a spreadsheet with usernames and passwords in it, please call me. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> and then uh, what was your second, what was the second part of that question? Um, yeah. Um, like when you look into your crystal ball, where is the solar monitoring industry growing, you yeah. know, going and how, and how is it changing? Yeah. I, I think there's these verticals, you know, you hear monitoring, you hear EMS and, and you hear DERMs, all these different energy data sort of silos. And I think at the end of the day, the, the reality is they're all still like so isolated from each other. 
you look at a monitoring system and it's it's almost universally a one-way data logger that's like uploading a CSV every you know five minutes. Um, you look at an EMS and it's usually a server installed on site that is running that that control loop and it, it maybe it reports to the cloud, but it, it can't take instructions from the cloud. And then you look at something like a derms or, or whatnot and and that's meant to be sort of cloud to edge control. Um, but these systems they're duplicative and they don't talk to each other. Um, I think what's coming is you know a unification of uh, of the monitoring and control planes for all of these assets, solar, storage, EV charging, hydroelectric, you name it, um, all these DERs. And I think the sort of better than the sum of its parts value that comes from integrating these capabilities into one platform is, is what's, is what's going to be pushing things forward over the next five years. I think it's an inevitability at this point. Um, and it's, it's a question of sort of what, what parts get integrated first. Sounds like a hard problem. Uh... Yes. <laughs> lots of stakeholders, lots of different requirements. Yeah. Um, you look at, you know, annual investor reporting uh, versus, you know, second by second energy dispatch decisions in an EMS. And, um, but it's all the same data. And, and I think mm. uh, it, it, all those different systems should be learning from each other, um, not uh, being procured and, and operating in isolation. Yeah. You mentioned learning and, and, you know, of course, AI broke onto the scene for, for the general population in 2023. Is that technology, these large language models, is that relevant to watch? That's a great question. Um, I will start by saying that what we're selling today, we do not use the words machine learning or AI. Our sort of performance models we talked about, the digital twin, um, it's physics. We, you know, we, we've just commercialized uh thousands of pages of research from, you know, the best minds, Sandia and REL in the space. Um, it is, these are deterministic, well-characterized, the behavior of, of silicon semiconductors is one of the best understood physical properties in the world, right? Um, so we're just commercializing academic research, making it easy to use. Um, there's no ML, and, and I don't think there should be, because you want deterministic, well-understood, uh, that's how you build confidence. Um, where I see the role of uh, machine learning and, and AI is in the, the predictive side, um, on the predictive maintenance machine learning, and then the large language models, which are certainly occupying the public mind share right now. It's very interesting to me um, when you, we talk about analyzing like maintenance logs. Obviously, that's a sort of a what do folks do with the insights that Watch gives them? They they make maintenance decisions and they go on site and they find the real root problem. And as that data set, not just with us but mm. industry wide, grows, I think there's you know, so much of those, those, those records live in disparate systems. And if we can bring it all together and analyze it, I think that there's, you know, just so much more uh, that, that can be done from an efficiency perspective. Agreed. Well, what else should our listeners know, Alex? Um, anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about? I think you asked some great questions. Definitely covered, uh, covered, covered the bases pretty well. Um, I think, you know, actually, you know, yeah, I think, I think that pretty much covered everything. I, uh, I really appreciate it. Great. Well, you can look forward to seeing Watch at, at many of the regional solar shows. Um, so, again, check out watch.io, W-A-T-T-C-H dot I-O, um, and check out the Clean Power Hour. All of our content is at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify, and tell a friend about the show. Um, Alex, how can our listeners find you? I think find us at Watch that's spelled with two T's. It's a great pun. Very funny. Watch.io will be at, uh, uh, like you said, all the regional shows. NABSEP, I think, is the next one coming up. Our distribute tech next week, this week, and then NABSEP after that. Um, and please get in touch. Reach out. Uh, even if you're not interested in uh, our product, we love connecting with people that are are imagining the future of, uh, of renewable energy. So um, don't be a stranger. Thank you so much. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about. Uh, you are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey, and it would mean so much to me 
If you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link right there on the main navigation. That takes you to the About page, and you'll see a big graphic, Listener Survey. Just click on that graphic, and it takes just a couple of minutes. If you fill out the survey, I will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it. The other thing I want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible by corporate sponsors. We have Chin Power Systems, the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in North America. So check out CPS America. But we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work. And you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show. You know, we're dropping two episodes a week. We have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube, and we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners, and our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com, both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit, and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more.